go into the cloud, unconfirmed transactions, and all the Bitcoin computers on, on, in the world have these unconfirmed transactions. And then a race begins. It's a competition. It really is a competition. Right, and this is where it gets really difficult. So, the competition works like this. There is an algorithm, or just a mathematical function, that takes the, the last block number, it takes, it takes a list of transactions, and it takes the nonce, that random number. And it, when you put all of these numbers into that algorithm, it spits out a number. Now the algorithm, for those who are interested, it's called the um, SHA-256 algorithm, it's a hashing algorithm. And the interesting thing about it is, if you put a load of information into that algorithm, it spits out a number. Spits out the number 27 million. If you change that number, change the input very slightly, it might spit out a completely different number, like two. Then you change it slightly again, it'll spit out 573,291. The point is, you can never predict what the output is going to be based on the input. You have to just run it through the algorithm, which takes a fraction of a second, very quick calculation. So, how does this competition work? All the Bitcoin computers in the world, try and create a new block. And what they do is they go, right, I'm going to construct a block. The last block was block number three. I'm going to take in some transactions so and I can pick any ones I want. I can decide, I really like Bob. I want Bob to get some money. Bob's going to be that next transaction. I can decide, I want to work on the biggest transactions. I can decide, I only want to process my own transactions. It is entirely up to you. And I'm going to run the, that block through the algorithm. And here's the competition. I need to find a random number of knots so that when I run it through the algorithm, the output is less than a particular target. So the output that comes out is less than the number 10, for example. So I run my block with the knot set as the number one through the algorithm, and I get an answer of 27 million. Well, I, I didn't win. I need to get target of less than 10, remember. So now I try changing the knots to the number two, and I run it through, and I get the number 53. Great, I'm getting closer to being less than 10. Right? Change it to, to being the number four. Oh, now I'm back up at 270,000. Change it to number five. And you don't know what the answer is going to be until you run it through. So all I'm going to do is I'm going to try random numbers from one, two, three, four, all the way up until finally I find the number and when I pass it through that algorithm, it gets me an output lower than the target. And that target quite intelligently defined. The target is set so that on average it will always take 10 minutes for all of the world's computers for one of them to come up with a block that works. And the way it does that, by the way, is every two weeks, all of the Bitcoin computers in the world look back over the last two weeks. They go, how long is it taking for people to crack the next block? Ah, it's taking eight minutes now because computer power's got better over the last two weeks. Right, we're going to lower that target. We're gonna make target narrow and make it harder. And conversely, if half the world has a power cut and it gets twice as difficult to find a block, they'll make that target bigger, target range bigger. So, just to reiterate that, every Bitcoin computer in the world tries to create a new block. But the only way to create a new block that, that wins the competition, that gets a number of less than target, is by trying lots and lots of random numbers. There's no intelligent incentive. You literally just try random numbers. And finally, after about 10 minutes, at the moment it takes about 900 quintillion tries to get a number that works, someone in the world will crack it. Sometimes it's quicker, sometimes it's shorter. On average, it takes about 10 minutes. So, I'm really lucky. I cracked it. My Bitcoin computer was the one that worked. So, my block, I distribute it around the world, I send it out to all the different Bitcoin ledgers. I said, right, accept that as the next block. You can check that this works, because if you run the algorithm with that last block number, those transactions and that knots, it hits the target, it's lower than the target, right. So everyone in the world adds that to their ledger, their blockchain. Bob's transaction goes through, but poor old Bert, who Alice was trying <coughs> to pay, his transaction just disappears, because everyone can then see, ah, it's got an input that's already been used in the transaction with Bob. So that's how blockchain now, if you're really acute, you might go, but hold on a second, there's a problem with this. What happens if two people create blocks at the same time? Don't we 
have exactly the same problem as we had with two transactions. We've got the same problem we were trying to solve. Now, while it's incredibly rare for this to happen, it can happen. And what I won't go into detail, it's slightly complex, but what happens is you can, at the end of a blockchain, have two or three actually, different variants around the world where different people have a last block on the end of their blockchain. But what will eventually happen is one of those blockchains will grow before another one. And it's that one that's longest that gets adopted around the world by everyone. So what that means is you should never trust the last block, because the last block might be different in different parts of the world in case two people solve the competition at the same time. That has some really important implications, by the way. So it takes 10 minutes, up to 10 minutes for a transaction to get onto the blockchain approved, and even when it's approved, you should wait a little bit longer until a few more blocks have been built up just to confirm that it is the best blockchain you can have. And the general rule of thumb is if you're transacting a million pounds or a million dollars or more, you should wait at least six blocks, that's six times ten minutes, that's one hour before that transaction goes through. It's a real problem with Bitcoin. Other cryptocurrencies, like Litecoin, they have two and a half minutes between Almost at the end of the technical points of this. Um, let's just recap. No trust is needed in any of this. So, when a transaction is sent, you use public, private, public to make sure that transaction is real. That's great. Transactions all refer to previous transactions, and you can check all of those previous transactions so you know people are double spending the same money that's been spent before. And transactions are ordered on those blockchains. So blockchains are really, really difficult. 900 quintillion goes to try and get one with all of the world's Bitcoin computers, millions of them working at once. No single person can hope to crack a blockchain in their lifetime. It takes years and years. So getting a new blockchain is proof that the whole network has been working to try and solve that mathematical competition. But where do Bitcoins come from? That's the one question I haven't answered yet. So, just think about it for a second. You've got all these Bitcoin computers around the world trying to validate the transaction and create a new block. Why? Why does anyone bother? Why do I turn my computer on and waste my electricity validating transactions to someone else? And the answer is that if you win the competition, if you are the one who creates that new block, you get rewarded with Bitcoin. And at the moment, if you win the blockchain, you get 12.5 Bitcoin. So at the moment, Bitcoin is worth about 600 American dollars. Good money. That's you know, thousands of dollars. I think seven, seven and a half thousand dollars. So that incentivizes people to do the, the verification process. Remember how I said that with commodity currencies like gold, you had the gold rush. People went out to West Coast America to mine the gold. This is the same. By giving people bitcoins for solving the competition, for finding gold, for finding that new block, you are paying them indirectly. Now the reward, that reward, that 12 and a half Bitcoin you get, halves every few years. So initially when Bitcoin was set up, you were rewarded with 50 Bitcoins. Then a few years later it was halved to 25 Bitcoins, now it's 12 and a half. In a few years time it will become 6.25, then it will become 3, and then less and less and less. And it will keep getting halved as an amount. And that is Bitcoin's way of managing inflation. The number of users of Bitcoin is controlled by reducing rate. We'll see the exact graph of how many bitcoins there are in a minute. At the moment, 16 million bitcoins are in existence, but in about 100 years' time, 2140, no more bitcoins will ever be mined. And the amount of bitcoins, in fact, won't stay stable, the amount of bitcoins will become deflationary because you can lose bitcoins. Remember, remember that guy who lost 2,000 bitcoins by getting into some computer code wrong? Bitcoins will be lost over time. Here's the real, a real graph showing the number of Bitcoins in existence. It goes from 2009, when there were no Bitcoins, all the way up to today. And over time, if you project that forward, it will smooth, the curve will smooth, you'll hit a plateau, and then it will start to decrease very slowly. And that, in a nutshell, is how Bitcoin works. We're stunned into silence. A lot of conflict. Any questions on that before we talk about the Set up 
two choices. Either you can set up your computer, and that's just all you need for computer, and it will do mining and it will do validation. Or you can use an online service, you can use an online wallet, and that will store your private key, and that will take care of everything. At that point, you've got a problem. If you're trusting that online wallet, you will not be hacked. And it has happened. In Japan last year, you had Matt Gox, one of the biggest Bitcoin exchanges in the world. Someone got into there, hacked all the private keys, and stole them. is a big problem, it is a big limitation. In theory, as computing power grows, and as the transaction ledger grows, that 24 hours should remain constant. So it's really kind of your choice. If you are buying an ecosystem in a way you're not, when you have a pound note or a single dollar note in your hand, it's much easier. The, uh, for the target, is there even a, a chance where someone gets to the target within the first, or first few tries, in a minute? Yes, I'm sure it has happened. So how quickly has someone hit the target? I'm sure it has happened that it's happened in seconds. I okay. don't know what the quickest one ever is. It'd be really interesting to find out. And there have been times where it's taken absolutely ages to hit targets. So okay. um, the 10 minutes is the average event. What is the purpose of limiting the Bitcoin? I understand it controls inflation and government cannot print money, but at 60 million Bitcoins and unlimited goods and services in the world, there's only a, a small country that can use it. Yes, a really good question, really good question. So Bitcoins are divisible. So you can split one Bitcoin into um, 100 million bits. So 100 million decimal. So 100 million. And each one of those bits is called a Satoshi. You know, like sing dollars, you've got cents, you've got Bitcoin, you've got Satoshis, and 100 million Satoshis make uh, the whole. So at some point in the distant future, you're absolutely right, and you'll get to the point where one Satoshi is now worth too much to transact like by having a company share that's worth a million dollars. You know, what do you do with it because no one can afford it anymore? Um, but that's in the very, very distant future. A long time ago, that was about to Yeah, I was going to ask you about the uh, I'll come back to you. Yeah, we've got one more section. Is it, it, it takes so long. I do online transactions go take forever to get through my payments, right? That's one of the challenges. Yeah, and this is one of the biggest problems for yeah. me personally with Bitcoin. So a transaction to get approved takes at least 10 minutes. Yeah. If you are not in that block, you might have to wait till the next block before your transaction is approved, so that's 20 minutes. And if you're sending a large amount of money, you want to wait until several blocks are there because Bitcoin can be, the blockchain can be unstable for a few chains back. So I think that's a real problem. Bitcoin aficionados who, who use this stuff regularly will say that is a very small price to pay for never having to worry about fraud or chargebacks. But that's one key to the side of the question. Uh, the transaction were, I mean, the ledger is public, but the transactions are private, is that right? Or, or no, so, so the ledger, the blockchain, has every transaction. Right. And that is completely public. Okay. Anyone can see that. Right. But what those transactions are, when Alice is giving Bob money, all you see is Alice's and Bob's public key, their bank account numbers, their email addresses, right. which are random numbers. Right. So, so the transaction of this bank account giving this bank account money yeah. is completely visible, but you don't know who owns this bank account. It's right. so all anonymous, but all the transactions are completely visible. And does the ledger track the actual Bitcoin as a like
proof, it's been validated, it's on the blockchain forever. Right? There is no recourse, there is no central bank to go to. I cannot have that transaction reversed. There is nothing you can do. <coughs> That's it, it is irreversible. And this is the reason Bitcoin was created, to stop reversibility, but it's also a huge limitation. Because in normal banking systems, if you have a, a fraudulent stop the competition again to create block number five. And some people are creating, creating block number five based on the bulk version, which is you. Some people are trying to create block number five based on the birth version that someone else has. And one of those guys will win. At some point, someone will create block five that works. They will send that out to the network, and they will say, here's block five. It works. And for those people who are already working on, let's say block five was built off the Bob version, this version. People already working on the Bob version go, that's great, it fits, it's got the right reference to the right block before, I'll plug that in. But people who are working on the birth version go, hold on, your block five refers to a different block four than I have. The blocks have reference numbers, I've called them block one, two, three, four. They've asked you all what unique reference numbers. The unique reference is wrong. So that means my blockchain is the wrong blockchain. You've got a longer blockchain. So I'm going to do something, I'm going to scrap my block four, I'll take your block four that you've built that block five off, I'll insert it, obviously I'll validate the thing, but go to the target. And at that point, everyone in the world is then working on the same blockchain again. However, there is an issue here. So, the whole point of Bitcoin is you assume the majority of computing power on the network is friendly, at least 50% is working in the spirit of if one user has more than half the power of the network, what they could do is they could get everyone to work away at creating their blockchain and create a very big blockchain. Behind the scenes, create a bigger block because they've got more than half the computing power, so they're going to win this competition more times. And then, after a load of transactions have happened, launch their new massive block into the network and go, I've got a bigger block, guys. While you've been working on that, I've created this block. Look at me, you should adopt my block. And that leaves it really open fraud, because what you can do is you can send a load of transactions, get a load of money, and then undo all of those transactions in your new block. Now what prevents that from happening? First of all, every second, 1.5 quintillion calculations are tried to create a new block. So if you want to beat that system, you need computer power to do one, at least 1.5 quintillion calculations a second on average, and you need a bit of luck as well on top of that. No one has that sort of but it has happened once before. There are syndicates of people who've grouped together to try and mine Bitcoin. So me on my little laptop here, there's no way I'd ever win a blockchain, right? Against the computer bank server somewhere. So what I do is I team up with a load of other people, all new people, get your laptops out, we link them all up and we use the combined processing power of all of our computers. There is one syndicate that has about one sixth of the entire computing power processing power on the Bitcoin there was one period in history where they managed to win that competition six times in a row. Absolutely unprecedented. With one sixth of the power, they just got really lucky. Now, the 
couldn't really have used that before because they were playing by the rules, they were distributing all the blocks as they produced them, and they were adding to everyone's chain. They weren't usurping any blocks, but they could have done. But it would be quite hard to have done that because they would have had to have known that they were going to win eventually, otherwise there'd be millions of pounds out of their pocket if they lost everything. So that answers your question. It's quite yeah. a technical one, really good question. Absolutely, it is just a game. It is a mathematical competition. You are exactly right. But the bitcoins is the equivalent to the other currencies in all money. That's right. So, um, so this is the heart of currency, right? So yeah. why does my ten pound note? Why can I pay for anything with this? And the reason is that everyone in England, we all agree that this is worth some money, and it's worth a particular number of potatoes, and I can exchange it for some potatoes. Why is a block of, block of gold? No, no, that's fine. So, yeah. so uh, transactions work like any other currency. Okay? Yeah. So I give you £10 or 10 bitcoins and you give me a service. The way the game works is the game is a way of validating that that transaction wasn't fraudulent, that it was really me giving you the money, and a way of maintaining a global ledger around the world so that we don't have one central bank or one bank that holds all of the information in one place. There are pros and cons of that. I don't use bitcoins. So this is a really interesting point. So Bitcoin mining, um, it really rewards early adopters. Because early adopters, remember, if you're an early adopter and you sold to blockchain, you got 50 Bitcoins. Now you only get 12.5. In the year 2140, you will get zero. So if you're getting zero Bitcoins, why would you bother validating any transactions and adding them to blockchain? And the answer is at some point in the future, Bitcoin, um, Bitcoin miners will demand a transaction fee. So when Alice says, here's a transaction that has 11 Bitcoins as an input, I'm going to give 10 to Bob, and the one left over goes to whichever Bitcoin miner cracks the next blockchain and puts my transaction on the blockchain. And a little bit of that happens at the moment. The transaction fees are tiny, though. They are absolutely minuscule compared to the 8% we saw of Indiegogo earlier. But you're right. There is a problem when you hit 2140. First of all, you have to divide the Bitcoin more and more. And this gentleman at the front was asking about how do you divide that? Well, you can divide each Bitcoin into 100 million different parts. So that doesn't become an issue for so long. But transaction fees will creep in. And remember, I said when I'm trying to find a new block for the blockchain, I can pick what transaction to go on there. I will be incentivized to pick the transaction. In normal practice, that's not an issue. If the whole of America loses electricity, it doesn't matter if there are millions of versions of the ledger on different computers around the world. However, there is a problem if someone cracks the algorithm, someone finds out a way to 
find you a private key, a private lock to open the public key. However, if that day comes, you should all be terrified, because that's how all electronic information is secured. So your online bank uses exactly the same process for its transactions, for its encryption. When you send money over the internet, you buy things over the internet when you use online banking, it uses public-private key cryptography. Now, as far as we know, there is no mathematical way to crack that. But there may come a day when someone, someone much smarter than me, in a lab somewhere doing math research, finds a way <coughs> to crack it. Um, it's all about um, prime number factorization. At the moment, we don't know of any way to do that. We believe it is a one-way transaction, but you're right. There is a huge risk to all commerce online, all digital transactions. If someone can find a way to do that, then we have to completely rethink the way we distribute money online. Really good question. I have one more question. Yeah. Then I'll move this on. So this is a transaction. I remember I said that the app here could be complex, like an escrow service. What you do is if I want a transaction to be verified in the future, after the year 2140, I will say, Bob will take 10 Bitcoins, I will take half a Bitcoin as change as Alice, and half a Bitcoin will go to whichever miner adds that transaction to the blockchain. I am giving you half a Bitcoin. At that point, Bitcoin becomes a very oligarchy. Whoever will pay the biggest fee <coughs> is more likely to get onto the blockchain. Transactions where you don't offer the binary fee probably won't. But the fee should still be much less than a bank to come up Real quick. Right. I'm going to move us on just in the interest of time. And we'll have plenty of time to catch up over pizza. So very quickly then. What are the implications of Bitcoin? Let's talk about the pros and the cons. So there are some very clear benefits of Bitcoin. Security. There is no trust required. Everything is proven by public-private cryptography. Everything can be checked on the blockchain. When you start Bitcoin mining, you check every transaction since the year zero. You don't need to trust anyone. No security required. There are no transaction fees at the moment. And when transaction fees, originally this slide actually did say, no slash low transaction fees, but even when tra transaction fees are required in the future, they should be significantly lower than, um, than bank fees. No third party seizure. If I've got a bank account and the government wants to seize that, really easy. They phone up the bank and say, lock this account, they seize it. You can't do that with Bitcoin. My bank account is on millions of computers around the world on this ledger on the blockchain. Bitcoins themselves cannot be stolen. That assigned to whoever had the private lock that, that works with that public key that it's assigned to. Transactions are irreversible. So if you're a merchant accepting Bitcoin, it's great. As soon as your transaction is on the blockchain at a stable point, it can never be taken back by chargeback by fraud or fraud. It's anonymous, so there's no tracking. So you set up your public and your private um, keys, and no one else will ever know who you are. And inflation is controlled, so the bank cannot just print loads of money like Zimbabwe. But there are some real problems, and many of these have been picked up on. The first one is, it is not widely accepted. Most people do not accept Bitcoins. Why would you? We've got perfectly good fiat money. I said fiat money is great. Fiat money has lots of uses. One of the things that they like is it's generally pretty widely accepted. Second of all, it's got a really volatile value. So, back, back to that question. The value can surge from you know, a few dollars per Bitcoin to a thousand dollars per Bitcoin, or anywhere in between. At the moment, it's about 600. That will only stabilize when it's used more and more by people. But it's quite technical. Most people probably won't want to use it ever. Because Bitcoin is completely anonymous and it can't be seized, it is used by a lot of criminals for illegal activity. They're probably the biggest users of the network. We'll never know because you know, the users are anonymous. But I suspect a lot of drug dealers use Bitcoin to transfer money across borders because they can't be stopped, they can't be seized, they can't be traced. It's really easy, right? Do you want to use a currency that the dominant user is a drug dealer? Probably not. Probably. <laughs> um, <laughs> the 
verification time, so it takes 10 minutes for a transaction to get onto the blockchain, and for big transactions you might wait se for several blocks to be created before you are absolutely sure that that blockchain is, is stable at that point. So you might wait up to an hour for a million pound transaction. A million pounds might, or a million dollars might sound like a lot, but in banking transactions they, they happen yeah, every few seconds, or many times every second. While Bitcoins cannot be stolen, the private Worse than that, actually, you can lose your private lock. So a few years ago, someone lost, I think it was 21,000 bitcoins because they had stored them on a hard drive and they threw, I kid you not, they threw the hard drive away with that private lock that gives him access to his or her bitcoins into, into the rubbish. They then went to the rubbish site and tried to find that hard drive. They could never find it. Those bitcoins are now gone forever. Yeah, it is, it is beyond, it, it sounds really silly, but it's the same thing with money, right? If I, if I drop this out of my pocket, I've now lost it forever, I'll never find that again. But this is, this is taking it to a whole new digital level down the back of the sofa, back of the couch, lost. And ultimately, there will be deflation and there will be transaction fees in Bitcoin. So after 20, 2140, you'll need to incentivize people to put your transactions on a blockchain, so that will require transaction fees. No one knows how big they will be. Um, they should be a lot less than banks charge because it's just automatic, there's no human involvement. But you also get deflation as people lose bitcoins, as bitcoins, you know, if I die with a million bitcoins in my wallet and I don't pass them on to anyone, that's it, they're gone forever. They will be. Much more interesting to me, and my final proper slide of the day is blockchain. Blockchain is actually the really interesting thing here. Bitcoin, I think, it's a bit of a fad. I, I don't use it. I think there are better forms of money out there, but it's interesting. A blockchain, there are some really evolutionary uses of blockchain. So, first of all, banks. Almost every major bank in the world is now researching blockchain. And when, when I say every major bank, I've got a list of them here. JP Morgan, Citigroup, Barclays, Commonwealth Bank of Australia, Credit Suisse, Bank of Scotland, UBS, Bank of Santa, the list goes on. Almost every bank you can think of is now collaborating to try and use blockchain. Because behind the scenes, as they do transactions between themselves, it's incredibly expensive. They have humans who check all their details. In the future, if they use blockchain, they could get rid of all of that back office rules and it could be done just through blockchain, through public, private back office. And actually, if Bitcoin was created to try and reduce transaction fees, now banks would document technology to reduce their transaction fees. What's the point of Bitcoin anyway? You can also use it for any other ownership. So intellectual property ownership is a good example. So if you own a painting, let's say you bought a nice Damien Hurst painting, right, and you want to check that that is a real painting, well you know what, Damien Hurst and every artist in the world in the future is going to have their own public and private key. And on the back of the painting there will be a barcode, the digital signature, and I can check that that digital signature has been created with Damien Hurst's public key, and that will confirm that it's his. And obviously that's, that's a bit of an arbitrary novel, but you think about uh, digital rights of music, sending music around the world, Apple tunes, all those kinds of things. Uh, in the UK, we've got a huge problem with land registry titles. Who owns plots of land? Who owns property? That's stored on thousands of pieces of paper. It takes lawyers a long time to confirm when you're selling property that you own it and no one else has claim over that land. In the future, if you've got a ledger, every bit of land in the country and the transaction chain of who owns it, no one could ever claim ownership of that land or fraudulently create a document that says that they also own that land. But that's just evolutionary, that's, that's using the blockchain to create ownership, to prove ownership. There are some really revolutionary ideas here. First one is self-executing programs. So instead of using blockchain to keep a list of transactions, why don't we use blockchain to keep a list executable files, computer programs, where once a certain condition is met and I sign that transaction using my digital key, that computer program is executed. I'm trying to come up with a good example of this. The only one I came up with is really morbid, so bear with me. <laughs> Imagine I write my last will and testament, so when, when I die, my money will be distributed to, to my loved ones. I 
on right now to a computer program and it's stored on a blockchain of all the wills and testaments of everyone in, in the world. And when I die, that bit of the blockchain is signed, that transaction is signed by the coroner in the UK to confirm I died and by my lawyer or by, by some public official to say, yes, he has died. And it automatically executes the code that transfers my will to my loved ones. Right? So you can suddenly start to do things Smart contracts are fascinating, actually. So you can have contracts where you need to agree, two out of three parties agree a job is done before someone is paid. You can write that on the blockchain. Uh, and finally, just one that came up last week. I was chatting to someone in MOH about rights and access to data. So looking after patient records in healthcare, we were just talking about healthcare earlier, um, is really difficult. You've got patients' records, and these need to be Some people need access to your records at some time, some people do not. How do you manage that? Well, what you do is you put patient's details onto a blockchain, like transactions for patient's details, and you say you can only decrypt them if we have the private key of that person's primary physician, or we have the private key of the hospital's accident and emergency department, or you have two private keys from someone's physician and a consultant doctor. There are lots of different ways you can work this. Honestly, the, the benefit is here, right? So, just to recap really quickly, um, we've talked about why does Bitcoin exist, there are problems with fiat currencies, there are problems with using money online, and there are benefits we've lost from commodity currencies that Bitcoin brings back. How does Bitcoin work? We've talked about how transactions use public-private key cryptography, we've talked about the transaction chain to make sure that actually you don't need to trust anyone, and we've talked about blockchain and how blockchain created blockchain the same way Finally, on the implications, we've had quite a good discussion actually about the pros and the cons of Bitcoin, but more interestingly, hopefully you find it more interesting, blockchain as a technology that needs to be So thank you very much. I suggest we get to the lunch. Yes.
So thank you very much again, Ravi, for spending time with us, uh, taking time off from your vacation. Right? Uh, pizza is here, right? Uh, uh, I think Carol is already opening up the box for pizza. So thank you again for coming. See you guys next week.